Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to show you how to isolate plasma DNA from bacterial cells using a mini prep kit. So this is a general overview of what the process typically looks like. Uh, there's a lot of different mini prep kits out there but they all follow basically the same routine. So first of all you're going to have a small liquid culture here, 1 to 5 ml of media that's been inoculated with cells and then incubated overnight at 37 degrees Celsius. A word of caution here, you might think that putting more media into this tube will get you more plasma DNA in your purified product, but that is actually not true. You can overwhelm this system if you start with too many cells. So never uh, exceed that initial culture volume of 5 ml. So anyways, that being said, uh, once you inoculate this uh, 5 ml of culture, you incubate it overnight, uh, you should have a nice turbid solution that's full of cells. And what we do with that is we centrifuge uh, anywhere from 3,000 to 10,000 G for about five minutes, depending on your centrifuge. And then that gives us a nice tight cell pellet at the bottom of the tube and a clear supernatant liquid, that's the spent media, up top here. And we decant that liquid into bleach just to make sure it's sterile, then we can pour it down the drain. Um, but the pellet here gets resuspended in a resuspension buffer. In this case, it might be called R3, for example. Now, that resuspension buffer does two things. First of all, it resuspends the cells, obviously, but second of all, it also contains RNAs. And so the RNAs will get into the cells and it will start to break down the RNA because we don't want that in our final product. Um, but for that reason, resuspension buffer is usually kept in the refrigerator. And so keep that in mind. If you're looking for it, it's stored in the fridge. After you're done with it, it should go back to the refrigerator so that the RNase A doesn't go bad. Anyways, once we have our cells resuspended in that resuspension buffer, we transfer them to an Eppendorf tube. And then to that, we add 200 microliters of lysis buffer. So this lysis buffer is simply a high alkaline solution that's going to pretty much degrade, break down, and dissolve uh, the bacterial cell wall and membrane. All right, so that's going to open up the cells. But at the same time, it also creates a particularly harsh environment that's going to cause all of the bacterial cell proteins uh, to aggregate, precipitate out a solution. The bacterial genome even, um, since it's so relatively large, it will precipitate out of solution as well, um, including all of the bacterial cell membrane debris. All of those things that we don't want in our final product at this point will precipitate out of solution <clears throat> uh, when we add this lysis buffer. But the plasma DNA will stay in solution. We then add a neutralization buffer to bring the pH down to neutral. At that point, you should see all of your uh, proteins and uh, genomic DNA precipitate as a single white, uh, snotty-looking uh, shape. And then, to isolate the plasmid from those solids, we centrifuge 12,000 G for 10 minutes. And that gives us a nice, clear supernatant containing plasma DNA and a few other impurities. To get rid of those impurities, we then transfer the sample to a spin column here. And that column contains a silica resin that binds our DNA. So the DNA binds along with a few other impurities, but most of the other impurities go straight through uh, down to the bottom of the tube, and we can decant those as waste. To get rid of the remaining impurities, we had two wash buffers. This wash buffer one goes on, we spin down, get rid of that. Then wash buffer two goes on, which by the way contains ethanol, and it must contain ethanol to keep the plasma DNA on the resin here, while the rest of the impurities go through the column. Okay, so just to be clear, if you forget to add ethanol to this wash buffer two, then your DNA will fall off the column. You'll lose your sample. So you don't want to do that. You want to have ethanol add it to the wash buffer too, add that, DNA stays on the column, impurities go through. All right, at that point we have some pretty pure DNA, so we add our elution solution, which might just be 30 to 50 microliters of ultra pure water to the uh, column, and at that point the water will strip the DNA back off of the column, and then if we centrifuge one last time, we'll end up with this sample down here that is purified plasma DNA. So there you go, from start to finish, that's how we purify the plasmid. So with all that being said, let's get started. The first thing you want to do is make sure you have everything you need. So here's an example of a bacterial cell culture sample. Notice that it's highly turbid. If it's not turbid, then put it back in the incubator. 
We've got some tubes here uh, that we're going to use for lysis, a spin column, and a collection tube for the purification stages, and then some highly detailed labels on some Eppendorf tubes because those are the uh, samples, that's where the sample is going to end up. So we want to make sure we got some good labels there. The resuspension solution that we'll use is stored in the refrigerator, so you want to grab that. The lysis solution, you want to check each time you're doing a mini prep to see if there's any precipitates in there. So there's SDS in the solution that might precipitate, and if it precipitates, then we don't get cell lysis. Um, but if you do see precipitates, just heat the solution um, up to around 50 degrees Celsius, they should resuspend. Then last but not least, there's that wash solution too. You want to make sure that you have ethanol in it, and you want to make sure you have some elution solution, uh, which could just be ultra pure water. All right, but now we've got everything, let's get started. So we're going to take our bacterial samples over to the centrifuge, and then we're going to spin them down at whatever G uh, force and time it takes to get a nice tight pellet. In this case, I'm going to be using a swinging bucket rotor with 50 ml adapters in this centrifuge. And the speed for that will be around 4000 G for 5 minutes. I want to take my 50 ml tubes and place them opposite on the uh, rotor to make sure the centrifuge is balanced. And then, like I said, I'm going to change the speed to 4000 G for 5 minutes. Now, depending on your centrifuge and the rotor you're using, you might have to increase the speed or increase the time. Some rotors have maximum speeds that are much lower, so if you had to centrifuge for, let's say, 2000 G, you might want to double the time to make sure you're pelleting all of the cells. All right, but after that is run, this is what the tube should look like. So be very careful to remove them gently. You don't want to resuspend your pellet here. Uh, but this is what a good cell pellet would look like. Something like something like this, where you see a nice tight pellet at the bottom, and the media above it is absolutely clear. If the media is cloudy at all, you'll want to repeat the centrifugation step to make sure you get as many of these cells as possible. Um, because the more cells you pull out of the solution, the more plasma you'll get at the end. All right. So once we have those pellets, the first thing we need to do is get rid of the supernatant media. And that could still contain plasmids and cells, so we decant that directly into bleach. The bleach will kill any cells, it will degrade any plasmid, so that'll just leave us with this cell pellet here. And after 24 hours, we can pour the bleach and media mixture uh, down the drain. Alright, so you want to do that for all your samples. And then to each of the samples, we're now ready to add resuspension solution. Uh, so you want to check to make sure that RNase has been added. If it has not, then take a, take a moment to add it here. Um, but if you do have RNase in there, then you want to add 200 microliters of resuspension solution to each one of your samples. Now, once you've added that, uh, then you can vortex the tube thoroughly to resuspend all of your cells. Now, this is probably going to take 30 to 60 seconds, depending on the g-force you used, how many cells you have. Um, but you want to vortex and then carefully check. You can see here I've still got a little bit of cell pellet at the bottom of the tube. And keep vortexing until all of your cells are resuspended. It's absolutely necessary that these cells are dispersed to get efficient lysis of the cells. And the more cells you lyse, the more plasmid you get. All right. Um, so once we have those cells resuspended, the next thing we're going to do is transfer them to a 2.0 ml tube. Just every subsequent step here is a lot easier if you're working in a smaller tube as opposed to a 50 ml tube, so that's why we're transferring them at this point. You can then throw away that 50 ml tube and repeat this for the rest of your samples. Also, please, please, please put the resuspension solution back in the refrigerator immediately, just so you don't forget to do it later. It needs to go back in the refrigerator so that the RNase A does not degrade. Next, what we're going to do is add the lysis solution to each one of these samples. So again, check to make sure there's no SDS precipitate. If there is, warm up the solution until it dissolves. But here it's clear, so we're going to add 200 microliters of lysis buffer to each one of those samples. Now, if you are working with a larger volume or a larger cell culture, uh, you could double these steps. So add double the amount of resuspension buffer, lysis buffer, and neutralization buffer. But 
200 microliters is a good starting point for most cultures. <clears throat> okay, so once I've added that uh, lysis buffer, the clock starts ticking. I need to first mix these tubes by inversion until they're homogenous. Then I let them incubate at room temperature for five minutes. Do not vortex these tubes to mix them. It will shear the genomic DNA and your final uh, product will be contaminated with genomic DNA. While those samples are incubating, if you have time, you can uh, start preparing the spin columns for purification by adding 500 microliters of column prep solution to each of those spin columns. So what this is going to do is it's going to wet the resin and pretty much get it ready to bind the plasma DNA. And you can just let that sit there. Um, you can try to close the caps, but honestly, a lot of times the caps just pop open. So don't worry too much about keeping these caps closed. All right. And then once that lysis is complete, after that five minutes, we're going to add a neutralization solution. So again, uh, what this does is it brings the pH back down to neutral after the lysis is complete. We don't want lysis to go any longer. If it does, then we risk damaging our plasmid or shearing the genomic DNA, uh, which would then contaminate our final product. So once I add the neutralization solution, I invert it to mix it, and I should get something that looks like this. You should see a white snotty material and a clear liquid solution besides that. So all of your impurities, all the things you don't want, are in the white snotty material, and your plasmid should be in the clear supernatant. All right, so you want to add neutralization solution to all of your samples. Close those tubes. Mix them thoroughly by uh, inverting them. And then we're ready to centrifuge these tubes to separate the white snot from the clear supernatant. Okay, so to clarify these samples, the next thing we're going to do is centrifuge them at 12,000 G for 10 minutes. But if you've already added the column prep solution, you can also put the spin columns in the, in the centrifuge at the same time, uh, just to save a little bit of time. All right, because we need to force the column prep solution through that column. All right, so we're going to spin here. Again, 12,000 G for 10 minutes. If you like, after one minute centrifugation, you can remove your spin columns from the centrifuge because that's all it takes to really uh, get the column prep solution through that resin. Um, but you can remove these columns uh, from the centrifuge. You should see there's a, a liquid that's gone through into the collection tube. And you can just decant that into a waste beaker. Once you do that for all of your samples, you can then continue centrifuging for the rest of the nine minutes that you need to pellet uh, the cell debris and the other things that are in your plasma DNA samples. All right, so after that 10 minute spin, your tube should look something like this. You should have a tight white pellet near the bottom of the tube with a nice clear supernatant on top of that. So you should absolutely have something that looks like this. If it's more diffuse, that's a sign that it might be contaminated. You, your culture might have been contaminated by something like a fungus. Now it's okay if you see something like these last two tubes where there's some pellet on the wall, um, but by all means you should have a clear supernatant. As long as you have a clear supernatant, you can proceed on to the next step. If you have something that looks cloudier, or if that pellet's not quite as tight as what you're seeing here, or as compact rather, um, then it might not be worthwhile to continue this mini prep. Uh, you might want to repeat the overnight culture to see if you can do it again without getting it contaminated. All right, but now that we've got our samples uh, clarified, the next thing we can do is load the samples, the lysate samples, onto the spin columns. Now here I'm decanting. You can also pipette uh, the maximum volume of these spin columns is about 800 microliters. I just find it's a little bit quicker uh, to just decant the sample into there. 
All right, so you want to repeat that for all of your samples, and then centrifuge again for 12,000 G at 12,000 G, but this time just for one minute. All right, and then once that spin is done, you should get something that looks like this. The liquid has gone through the column. You can now decant that liquid into a waste beaker and then repeat that for the rest of your samples. Now, you may have very well uh, have more than 800 microliters in your sample. If that is the case, then just load the rest of your sample onto the spin columns and repeat this spin. So you can do that as many times as you want. If you've got a larger sample, you can uh, do multiple spins to load all that on there. But I do want to point out here, be very careful that you don't get any of that white pellet material onto the spin column because that represents impurities. So you could contaminate your final sample if any of that white material gets onto the spin column. So definitely err on the side of caution here. If you're trying to get the last few microliters of your, uh, your, your supernatant here, but there's little pieces of white chunks that are floating around, just leave them behind. Uh, err on the side of caution and leave any white chunks at the cost of sacrificing some plasma DNA in that uh, lysate tube. All right, so here we go. We've done the second spin now, and we're gonna decant the rest of that liquid for all of our samples. So at this point, our plasma DNA should be tightly bound to that resin, um, but there's also some impurities. So we have to add our first wash solution here now. We're going to add 500 microliters of wash solution one. Now, very importantly, this is a buffer that will not dissolve the plasma DNA the plasma DNA will stay on the resin, but impurities that are bound to the resin will fall off. They will loot from the column during this step. So I add that uh, wash solution one to each of my tubes and then balance them on the centrifuge here, loading them opposite one another, and I spin at 12,000 G for another minute. Right, so I feel like I'm repeating myself here, but once again, you'll take the tube out. Your liquid will have gone through the column to the bottom of the tube. You're going to decant that into the wash buffer, or the, uh, the beaker there, and you're going to do that for all of your samples. <clears throat> so now we have partially purified DNA on the resin, but there's still some impurities that are left. So once again, I just want to remind you that this wash solution too has to have ethanol added to it. Um, so it's always a good idea to just waft a little bit to make sure you can smell the ethanol, or at the very least mark that the uh, ethanol has been added on the, the bottle. But what we're going to do here is add 700 microliters of wash solution two to each of these tubes. Once you've done that, you're going to spin the tubes again at 12,000 G for one minute. And what this should do is remove the last of the impurities from that silica resin, making sure that they then have purified plasma DNA on the column. But we're actually not done yet. So what we're going to do next is take that collection tube and decant as much of the ethanol as possible but then we're going to put that tube right back into the centrifuge and spin again at 12,000 G for one minute. So the idea here is that there might still be some residual ethanol on the column. So we're going to spin again to make sure we get as much of the ethanol off of that column as possible before we elute the DNA. And that's because trace amounts of ethanol can inhibit downstream applications that you might have in mind for these plasma DNA samples. So here we go, now we spun the column again. It should be dry, absolutely no ethanol. So at this point, we transfer it to a fresh Eppendorf tube. All right, so this is the one that we labeled earlier. This is where we're going to elute our plasma DNA into, so make sure that that tube is uh, nice and labeled with every detail that you might need to identify the sample. All right, so we're going to load those spin columns into those tubes, and then we're going to put anywhere from 25 to 100 microliters of elution solution onto those columns. Now what you want to do here is you want to be very careful to add the elution solution directly to the middle 
of that spin column. You want to make sure that you get the liquid onto the resin. Don't add it to the side of the tube because it needs to be in the resin to strip the DNA from the tube. Now one thing that can help you get slightly higher yields here would be if you preheated that elution solution to 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. You might actually strip more DNA off the column than if the elution solution were at uh, room temperature. Uh, if you can't find the elution solution, ultra pure water also works for this step. All right, so we're going to centrifuge one last time, 12,000 G for one minute. And at the end of this spin, we're going to take our tubes out. And right there at the bottom of the tube, we should have a purified solution of plasma DNA. At this point, you can remove the spin columns from the tubes and go on to quantify the DNA concentration with a nano drop or take three plate. So here's how you would use the take three plate to quantify the concentration of DNA in your plasmid sample. Uh, first of all, you want to take the plate out of its uh, carrying case. It's a very expensive uh, piece of equipment, so please take care of it. Um, but you want to make sure that it is clean. But this is where we're going to load the samples here. In the first row, you need to load a blank. Ideally, this should be the elution solution uh, that you use for the last step of the mini prep, um, but ultra pure water works here as well. We just want to get a sense for what the baseline absorbance of the plate itself is so that we can subtract it from these samples to get an, a more reliable estimate of the DNA concentration. So what I'm doing here is I'm pipetting one microliter of the blank and all of the samples onto the spots that are on the take three plate. Now you want to be very careful here to make sure that you're using a fresh tip for each sample. You don't want to cross contaminate them. And when you pipette the solution onto the well or the spots on the plate, uh, you want to make sure that you're not ejecting any bubbles. Any bubbles, no matter how tiny they are, can actually interfere with the uh, measurements that we're about to take here. But here we go. Once we've got the samples loaded, we carefully close the take three plate as shown. Make sure the plate reader's on if, it, if you haven't turned it on already. Open the tray and then close it. And now we're ready to open the Gen 5 software. So when you open that, this is what you'll see. Click on nucleic acid quantification and then set where your blank and your samples are. Then you can click read and this is what you should get. So a good spectrum for DNA looks something like this. There's a nice peak, a well-defined peak around 260 nanometers. Then you can close that and go back to the sample layout. If you mouse over one of the wells, you'll be able to see the uh, concentration in each well in nanogram per microliter. You can also see the purity as a 260 over 280 ratio, which should be around 1.8 to 2. Now, once you're done with the take three plate, wipe it off with a chem wipe. Make sure you get all the sample off of there and then put it back in its storage container. You also want to take the concentration measurements that you just uh, recorded and put those onto directly onto the sample tubes. And if this is the last time you will be uh, using the plate reader today, please turn that off as well. Now, once you've done all this, uh, you can store these plasmid samples at negative 20 degrees Celsius um, for as long as you need to, or you can use them immediately for downstream applications like digestion or cloning or something like that.